Welcome to Kent Channel. And with us today, we again have Dr. Robert D. Eldridge, who was with the Marines in Okinawa until very recently. Um, um, welcome. Thank you. I want to ask you, uh, because at least the, the, uh, to me, one of the most famous things you did was the uh, Operation Tomodachi, which happened after the earthquake. Uh, that happened on March 11th, 19... Not 19, 2011, right? Correct. Um, there was a huge tsunami, washed away half of Tohoku, basically, and uh, a huge disaster. Was the the uh, geographical scope of that was just mind-boggling. Correct. And uh, the the Americans um, jumped right in, mm -hmm. um, which I found really really interesting because when they had the Kansai earthquake, mm -hmm. which is about 12 years ago or 13 years ago, uh, well, 20 years ago from now. Was it 20 years ago? Yeah. Oh 1995. Gosh, I, I was in that earthquake too. Oh my so. gosh, that's a long time ago. Anyway, that the Americans were told to, to butt out mm -hmm. on that one. Um, there was nothing for them to do, which mm -hmm. I found really amazing as the whole city, as I watched the whole city burn down on television. Mm -hmm. So um, um, it just was amazing to me they wouldn't draw on those resources. So I'm wondering what happened in the meantime that uh, the Americans and the Japanese were able to get together on this, something like this so quickly. And that was another thing that was, that was so quickly. Correct. Um, well, there was a lot of learning, I think, that took place, uh, particularly by Japan, uh, in the interim. And the, uh, the, the uh, Japanese self-defense forces uh, came to be uh, greater embraced by the Japanese public. Mm. The and Japanese really rely on them for disaster relief, don't they? Correct. And, uh, the, and they're good at it. Uh, yeah, they're excellent at it. And they're... Uh, the 1995 uh, disaster um, response, um, even though the civilian leadership was late in requesting them, um, they, they did some very good work. Um, and then there have been a number of disasters since then that they were very good at responding to. So that's one thing. Uh, secondly, the um, relationship between the uh, self-defense forces and the U.S. military has gotten even closer in the past uh, two decades. Um, and on the uh, occasion of uh, March 11th, um, that relationship had really, really been growing uh, closely. Um, the Marine Corps, in the meantime, uh, over the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, has uh, been heavily involved in responding to a lot of the natural disasters in the Asia Pacific region. Mm -hmm. and there's yeah. basically a significant disaster, large-scale disaster, at least once a year in mm -hmm. the Asia-Pacific region. And it's always the Marine Corps that's either in the lead or facilitating the response. Some of those guys have been in Nepal recently. Correct, exactly. Yeah. So um, Nepal before that in 2013, uh, the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the big hurricane. Correct. So um, the Marines, we call it the, here, I suppose. the Marines are, are known as the 911 force, the Rapid Response <laughs> Force. Um, so they're they're forward leaning already, and mm -hmm. they have a, a wealth of experience. Um, with regard to Operation Tomodachi, um, personally, I, I've been involved in disaster response and thinking uh, since uh, the 1995 Hanshin Awaji uh, earthquake. And I had made a proposal back in 2006 that if a disaster along the lines of the great East Japan earthquake and tsunami were to happen, U.S. forces in Japan should be and could be utilized in this way. So a lot of the, um, I guess, the blueprint mm -hmm. for you know, what, what became Operation Tomodachi had been written, or I had written it. That's so. really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, we're, did you receive some sort of inspiration that this was coming, or is just something you're interested in? Um, in I don't know if it's inspiration, but I, I, I'm pretty good at predicting mm -hmm. how things are going to evolve. Mm -hmm. um, there were two critical events that help, helped me get to that point. Um, one was the, the Kobe earthquake, mm -hmm. and the other one was the Sumatra uh, earthquake mm -hmm. in 2004. Oh, wow. That was a big one. And I happened to be working for the Marine Corps at that time, Mm -hmm. uh, on a sabbatical from mm -hmm. Osaka University. And um, uh, I was involved in the initial response. And then a year after that, 
when I was back at Osaka University, I hosted an um, international symposium looking at one year after the, the uh, disaster. And the thing that I found interesting is that nobody asked the question, what would happen if something like a Sumatra earthquake and tsunami happened in Japan? Mm. The focus of the discussions and the comments were that Japan provided international assistance and help, and they did it in a, a fairly timely manner. So they had the ability to deploy and, and help out and then to work internationally. And that's great, and that was beautiful. But no one posed that question, okay, what would happen if that occurred in Japan, and would Japan be able to, to accept that international support? Mm -hmm. Because no one discussed it, uh, I became very concerned about that, and I launched a study on crisis management, mm -hmm. lessons learned from Kobe, mm -hmm. and uh, what needed to be done. And so, uh, so I released those recommendations in 2006. So those recommendations were out there, and all they needed to be is implemented. Correct. Did we have to wait for the uh, Japanese to ask us to go? Formally, yes, but uh, because it's a forward-leaning organization, sure we moved out right away. Because it's a forward-leaning organization, <laughs> um, let me be diplomatic here. Uh, <laughs> because it's a forward-leaning uh, organization, they were really ready to. to uh, they had everything they needed to be ready to go. Um, for example, it was the, really impressive. The um, the essentially the crisis response uh, cell um, was stood up within 10, 15 minutes. You're kidding me. Um, and That's so, fast. And, uh, and then the next morning, um, the old helicopters, the ones that the MV-22 Ospreys mm. replaced, started to leave. They had to leave early because they were so slow to get all the way up to northern uh, Japan. Mm. It took them basically three days to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and in the meantime, planes were being sent. If we had the Ospreys then, mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't have been three days. It would have been three hours. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's too bad. They're too late. Well, next time we'll have those. <laughs> and, we, and there probably will be a next time. There will be. I yeah. was really impressed with how fast they got the Sendai Airport put back together. That was a, um, uh, an, an incredible experience. And uh, fortunately, the... In that situation, um, our experiences and the Japanese government, the support we got from the Japanese government to allow us to make mm -hmm. that proposal and go in and, and do that uh, was incredible. I was, uh, was one of the very first Americans to, to go into Sendai Airport, and uh, I'll never forget it. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, you've told me the, the story of this before. and. Uh, you know, they, they were saying it was going to take months to get this, the airport back up and running. And you said, we don't need a new terminal. We don't need radar. We don't need anything but a runway. <laughs> and the Marines can build a runway. <laughs> so they did. And you had it up within a week. Uh, well, about in Eight three days. Th three days. Yeah. Oh, three days. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, my gosh. So it wasn't, nece fast. it wasn't necessarily building a runway. It was uh, getting the uh, runway usable again. Right. It had and a runway. Right. Really sort of right. So that was the big difference between Japanese thinking and um, and American military thinking mm -hmm. is that um, particularly the Marine Corps is an expeditionary organization. Mm -hmm. So um, just give us a flat open area, and a lot of things can happen you there. Can make you an airport. Right. So there was a great teamwork with the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And then great teamwork with the ground self-defense forces um, throughout the Japanese government, uh, and um, especially with the local airport authorities, um, who partnered with uh, you know local businesses too. So we arrived there Tuesday morning, and I think the first military air aircraft landed uh, on Friday. Oh wow, that's just amazing. Well. I tell you, leave it up to the U.S. military; they'll get it done. <laughs> but it's but it's fortunate that we had this blueprint, and it, that was written by you. It's, it's amazing. Um, okay, thank you. I, I want to okay. ask you some other stuff, but we will do that in another program. Okay, thank you.